All right, this is the list you guys have been waiting for. These are the top 10 cliches that drive me crazy. Now, I notice a lot of cliches that people like, I like too, and we like seeing them over and over. These are the ones that I personally can't stand seeing. And a lot of people do lists about cliches. And I'm not saying these are the worst cliches. These are just the ones that I hate, that I personally despise. I feel they ruin a movie. A lot of these films would be fine if they didn't have these in here. A lot of them keep using all these cliches in one, so why waste any time? Let's talk about the top 10 cliches that I hate. Number 10. Calling women girls. We've seen this in Blues Brothers, Ghostbusters, Red Sonja, Superman 2. To me, girl is like birth to high school. College, maybe. You know, a lot of them look a lot younger, so I can understand. When you're a when you're you're a woman, okay. When you got tatas, nice big tatas, you are a woman. If you're gonna go out there, you're gonna save the day. You're gonna be strong, and you know all this stuff. You're not a girl anymore, okay. You're a woman. And I know the idea that a lot of people like to think, you know, oh well, girl is younger, and you know. Da -da -da that shit. If you're gonna be a main character, if you're gonna be, you know, going out there doing it with the guys and stuff like that, you're a woman, okay? <laughs> Girls, you know, I think of like, like I said, high school or playing on playgrounds or something like that, and for me, it's hard for me to take a character seriously when they keep calling what is obviously a grown woman a girl. And actually, the biggest cases for me I think of are in Space Mutiny, where they actually make fun of that, because the woman is like, I don't know, in her 80s or something like that, they keep calling her girl. And I think in Plan 9 from Outer Space, these are both mystery science theaters, uh, they keep calling this character girl. And it's so obvious she's in like her 40s or 50s. So... I guess it, that's more of a pet peeve, but it's a pet peeve that really bothers me. Uh, the other cliches are probably going to be a lot more obvious, so, uh, but yeah, that one always gets to me. Number nine. The shaky cam. We've seen this in Transformers, in Batman Begins, in Batman Forever, in God knows how many Jerry Bruckheimer productions. What's the point? Now here's the thing, if you want it to look realistic, a little shaking is okay. When somebody's running, the camera shakes a little bit. But nobody runs like this! Because <laughs> that's what you see half the time. You just see a person, I mean, the person must be going through a seizure when they're running or, or filming this. I mean, this is, I think of like in The Rock, there's a scene where like, Sean Connery's just talking. Uh, in the car, and literally the camera is zooming in and out. Or what the hell's that new one? Um, it's the Denzel Washington train movie. I cannot forget. Unstoppable. Unstoppable. Every shot in this movie zooms in, zooms out. Zooms in, zooms out. I... It was on a plane when I was flying once, and the sound wasn't even on. And it was annoying the shit out of me. This camera would not stand the fuck still. It was going zoom in, zoom out, zoom in, zoom out. And it... If you really just want to see an experiment that doesn't work, see that movie, because all it is is zooming in and out. I mean, it's what person does that? How does that make it more realistic? Do you ever have a conversation with someone just going, No, you don't! It's crazy! So, I think a lot of people hate the shaky cam. I think we're sick of it. We like to see the action, and anyone can do this. So, please, please, people out there, a little bit is okay, make it realistic, but just keep it still, man. Keep it still. Number eight. Sucky credits. Again, we've seen this in Batman Forever. We've seen it in Liar Liar. We've seen it in Mrs. Doubtfire. We see it in movies that just don't care how they start. They're just like, oh, no, we don't care. They're just credits. Roll it. And that pisses me off because that's the perfect moment to suck people in. Give them an idea what kind of world you're going to see. You know, play some music. Let the musicians really span their, you know, their talents. Really try to get people in this movie. And so they just start it. I mean, and show nothing. It's like people are talking. There's just little credits flashing at the bottom. It's like, it's like a TV show. With a TV show, I understand. You have to get the show going. You only have a certain amount of time. With movies, it's a movie. And people used to get really creative with credits. They would have these big opening productions. They'd have animations. They'd have uh, all sorts of little atmospheric things that they would do. Now, 
which I don't mind, they're starting to do it at the end of movies. Like with 300, they did that. Uh, I, I think uh, some of the Mummy movies are doing that. Uh, those are terrible movies, by the way, but I digress. Um, so more and more people are doing sort of these big collages and stuff at the end, which technically is more clever because you're looking back at the good scenes from the movie while the credits are rolling. So that's kind of clever. Um, but I like them at the beginning. Like, I think of Ben Knobs and Broomsticks and, you know, the, the drawings and the music. And God, that just that gets you hyped up for the movie. So credits are a great chance for people to get hyped up, really excited, and if you don't take advantage of it, man, you're a fool. Number seven. Relying too much on CGI. And we all know the two people have been doing way too much of this. Lucas and Spielberg. They have been relying way too much on CGI. Now, CGI can be used very well. Uh, my thought is that it's very good at making things disappear or creating worlds or creating atmosphere. Good examples, uh, Sin City, that, uh, that last film version of Peter Pan, or um, actually even some of the backgrounds in the new Star Wars movies look very nice. But when you have to get close-ups, when you have to see people there... Uh, use actual people. Use actual things. Get the puppets back. Get the animatronics. I know it's cheaper, but we know it's not there. Sometimes you can't help it. Uh, Transformers, I get. You have to use the CGI. I understand that. But for things like Indiana Jones, what's the best scene in the last Indiana Jones movie? It's when they were having the chase with the motorcycle. Why? Because it was actually happening! It was really there! Um, another example that just... The Robert Zemeckis thing. Like, this is all he's doing now is making these CGI movies. And at first, I was kind of intrigued. I was really sort of blown away by the technology, but... By the time we got to Mars Needs Moms, which, thank God, bombed, and I think closed down that production, uh, I'm sorry people lost their jobs, <laughs> but I, I mean, just for the sake of art, uh, that was done, that was it, because, here's the thing, they try so hard to get people to look realistic, you know, Jim Carrey at Christmas Carol, yeah, you can make his nose long, yeah, it sort of looks like he's really there, here's a crazy idea, why not really put him there? Why not just have an actor there? If you're gonna go animation, do animation. You know, make it so that the eyes can get big or, you know, someone's jaw can go, Ugh, you know, or whatever. Let the animator express himself. Let animators do what animators are supposed to do. With this, you're restricted. And I saw this really in the previews with Mars and these moms. You get all these weird visuals going on and these dull human faces on these CG puppet bodies. And that's what they look like. They don't look alive. They look like puppets. And animation is not supposed to do that. It's supposed to make something look alive. And oddly enough, having a person in there when you put the little dots on is too much. So... Bottom line, I'm not against CGI, all of it. Uh, if, if you look at some older effects for, like, Ghostbusters and stuff, some of them look great, some of them are really dated, and some CG would have helped that. But, yeah, we rely way too much on it, and we, we got to back down, man. We got we to do, like, the Lord of the Rings path, where they sort of did half and half. So, um, yeah, I, I think we really... Let, let's get some flesh and blood back in there. Number six. Overusing the wide-angle lens. You saw me just talk about this in Baby Geniuses. Danny DeVito does it a lot in his movies. Whenever a movie obviously just has no cinematic creativity, they just go to the super tight wide-angle shots. And when they first start doing it, it was interesting. We, we hadn't seen wide-angle shots that much, but by the 20th time we have to see somebody like this, it gets really annoying, and you just want to push the screen away from you. I don't know why people rely on it so much. I guess it's because they want to look different. They want to look artsy. They want to look like, hey, we're doing something that nobody else is doing, but everybody else is doing it. So, finally, people are starting to back down a bit, but there are still some directors out there that still think they're being really innovative and avant-garde by doing this. It's not. It's tiring. It's boring. I'm sick of it. Uh, wide angle is a wonderful device to use. Just stop putting it this close to a person's nose. Number five. The Poetic Singer. This is another one I've gone on and on about. 
You've seen it in Avatar. You've seen it in District 9. You've seen it in Black Hawk Down. You've seen it in Gladiator. It's when a big dramatic scene happens where somebody dies or somebody's remembering something poetic and you hear that singer. That singer that goes, Oh, hello. And, oh, ear poison! It is ear poison! I can't stand it! And every time I hear it, I want to strangle the lady or man who is singing it! It's so obnoxious! I, mmm! I, I've talked about this one so much, I don't even want to talk about it that much. I just know whenever there's a pretentious movie, if you want a movie to be pretentious, it's just like, boom! Pretentious! There's no turning back. You get that singer. You get that son of a daughter of bitch person because... That person is a paid. I'm sure he or she's making great money or it's a couple people doing it. I don't know, but shut that person up. Stop using him, her, it. Number four. The whimsical, innocent, rebellious poet. At least half of Robin Williams' movies are this. The meek, kind of quirky person who has a heart of gold but screws up sometimes. But gosh darn it, he's trying. This has probably come from the 90s Disney films with like Ariel and Belle and Aladdin and all these characters that dream of more and want so much more, but they're just so quirky. Uh, and in Disney films, actually, they work okay, but even that's getting really overused. Uh, in romantic comedies, there's always the woman. And Julia Roberts movies where, yeah, she screws up. Sometimes she does the wrong thing, but you know what? Gosh darn it, she cares. And uh, the person going up against the man, the big establishment, the rebel, you know, and the, the big bad people who put him down just because he wanted to dream and we don't understand. And it, you see this with a lot of uh, movies about, you know, people with special needs and stuff, which, you know, I'm not saying, you know, that they don't need special needs. I'm not saying that. It's that this has just been done so many times and it hasn't been done in a new way, or a way that really makes you care. It's a way we've seen a bajillion other times, and I'm just sick of the stuffy, you know, person who just waves the finger and says, you don't get it, you don't understand, and the young rebel says, yes, I do, and I'm gonna show you when they go all determined, and yeah, they make some mistakes, but they come through, and we're on their side. Fucking hate those people, fucking hate those movies, fucking hate that cliche. Fucking hate it. Well, I'm very angry in this video. 